But joining us now is Neil Borofsky, former uh, Inspector General for TARP. You saw him earlier on a panel. Here's the cover of his bestseller. It's called Bailout. First of all, Mr. Borofsky, uh, how did you become the Inspector General for TARP? You know, it was sort of a, a, a strange thing, especially for me. I was just a federal prosecutor uh, up, in, up in the Southern District of New York, and I had spent the years leading into the financial crisis doing securities fraud cases. And then earlier in 2008, I had started up a mortgage fraud group uh, that was targeting um, you know, those types of cases that really helped lead to the financial crisis, m major fraud in, in, in the mortgage finance system. Um, so after the TARP bill was passed, when Congress you know, enacted this remarkable piece of legislation, um, they included within it this new agency called the Office of the Special Inspector General for the Troubled Asset Relief Program. You know, this incredibly great, you know, uh, Washington is a city of acronyms and ours was SIGTARP. Um, and a call went out to the different U.S. attorney's offices around the country looking for someone who had experience in mortgage fraud and in securities fraud. Um, and I had that experience. Um, so I was nominated by my boss, who is the U.S. attorney. Um, and it was sort of this this crazy whirlwind of six weeks from when he had that conversation with me to when I was actually confirmed and started uh, and serving as, as the Special Inspector what General. What was the date that you started? I started December 15, 2008. Okay. Uh, what are your politics? You were nominated by, well, by the Bush administration, essentially, but what are your politics? So I've been a lifelong Democrat. Uh, my, you know, since I was old enough to vote, uh, I've always been a registered Democrat. And it's actually kind of funny when, when the U.S. Attorney, Mike Garcia, when he approached me and asked me if I was interested in the job, and I was sort of going through different excuses of why I didn't want to go to Washington. I was you know, very happy with being a prosecutor. It was the only job I ever really wanted. I was getting married. Uh, but finally, when, um, when all those arguments had failed, I, I sort of said to him in a very dramatic way, by the way, you know that I am, in fact, a, a, a registered Democrat. And he kind of winced. And then I, I thought I had the killer when I came back and said, and I contributed to Barack Obama just two weeks ago to his campaign. Uh, but it was, it was not a political appointment. It was a merit appointment. And uh, I think they, they just thought I had the right experience to protect this giant bailout from, from criminal fraud. Uh, so I think that's why I got the job. Neil Borofsky, when you look back at the legislation itself, not how it was administered, but when you look at the legislation, what were some of the flaws in it, in your view? You know, I think that, you know, often ha what often happens, and it's, it's understandable given, you know, the sense of emergency that this was a hastily crafted bill. Um, but one of the problems, it had a lot of policy goals in the bill, uh, but it didn't have the mechanisms. It didn't mandate certain mechanisms to carry out those policies. So, for example, the idea behind TARP was that it was going to uh, help expand the economy and, you know, money wasn't just going to the banks, it was going to go to the banks uh, for the purpose of broader economic recovery. Uh, but it gave a tremendous amount of discretion to the Treasury Department uh, to carry out those policies. And ultimately, a lot of the policies that were adopted disconnected uh, you know, the program goals with the actual uh, how the program performed. So we had a housing uh, initiative that was supposed to help 4 million people, but only ended up helping about 800 and something thousand uh, out of that goal. And I think that, you know, a lot of times too much discretion was given to Treasury, and that led to too few strings being attached to the money um, and not really execution all that well in achieving some of the more important Main Street goals of, of the program. 202 is the area code. You can see the numbers up on your screen. If you'd like to participate in our conversation with Neil Borofsky, author of Bailout 585-3885, if you live in the East and Central time zones, 585-3886 for those of you in the Mountain and Pacific time zones. Mr. Borofsky, you worked with uh, Henry Paulson, Treasury Secretary, for what, about a month, a month and a half or so, and then with Tim Geithner, of course, over the years. What was your relationship with the two gentlemen? Well, with, with Secretary Paulson, as you said, it was, it was a much shorter period of time. But um, I found him very candid with us and very accommodating. It was, uh, you know, he swore me into office. Uh, I sat in his office. I, I put my hand on the Paulson family Bible and took the oath of office. Um, but almost immediately, right from the beginning, he was very solicitous. He really wanted to hear where I was coming from, where my office was coming from, uh, wanted our input on 
at that very meeting asking about the auto bailout and sort of what types of protections we thought would be necessary to protect the program from fraud. Um, now, with his Treasury Department, we had some serious tension as we were pushing for more transparency and more conditions. They were certainly pushing back. Uh, but personally, I, I did find that he was interested in what we had to say. Um, and one of, as one of his chief lieutenants said, he wanted to make this work. Um, our relationship with Secretary Geithner was, was different. It was, uh, he was pretty much dismissive from day one. Um, he wasn't really terribly interested in, in hearing from me or hearing from our office or working with our office. Why not? Um, over the course of two plus years, I had um, two one-on-one -on -one meetings with him. That was it. One was about 30 seconds. The other was a longer affair where he l literally cursed me out um, for suggesting that he was anything other than sufficiently transparent. Uh, I think the l language, I won't use the actual language, but I'm the most transparent Secretary of the Treasury in the history of this country and really couldn't believe that I was suggesting otherwise. Um, and I think the also the other thing with, with Geithner is that there was a lot more nastiness behind the scenes, you know, false leaks of false information to the press that came out of his Treasury Department, and a lot of, you know, dirty Washington political tricks that I think we were, that were directed towards us. Now, I don't know if he was personally responsible for that, but under his Treasury Department, we saw a lot more of that under, under Secretary Geithner than we did with Secretary Paulson. What grade would you give the administration of TARP? Oh, it's got to be an F. I mean, it, it, it really does, because, I mean, a lot of people will say, well, hey, it helps save the the, the financial system, and we didn't have a bigger financial crisis, and that's true, and the, and the program deserves some credit for that, you know, but ultimately, the program wasn't just about saving the financial system for the sake of saving the financial system. It was to spur a broader economic recovery. It was to preserve home ownership by keeping people in their homes. It was, as we were told, the money was going to go to the banks, but then get deployed, not hoarded. Uh, so it would go into the economy to increase lending, so there'd be less misery throughout the country. Um, and it just none of that happened. Um, so I think it, there was it was helpful in preserving a status quo. Um, it didn't achieve those major policy goals. And even with that status quo, what did we really save? We saved a broken system of too big to fail banks through the TARP. We made them even bigger, even more dangerous. Um, and really, in many ways, I think today we're still on a path to potentially another financial crisis because of the decisions that were made back in 2008, 2009, and 2010. Before we got started and before we go to calls, a, a viewer walked by here and saw the book and said, make sure to ask him about the fiscal cliff and whether or not you have an opinion, whether or not you have some knowledge. What would you like to say about the fiscal cliff? Well, you know, I, I think the fiscal cliff, it's, it's a great nickname, um, but I think it, it sort of creates a sense of emergency that if like nothing happens by January 1st, the entire economy is going to crater into the next Great Depression. And I think that that's not really what's going to happen. I think there's some, there's some degree of, 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 of time before this combination of tax increases and spending cuts. Um, you know, my general feeling on the fiscal cliff is that we don't, ha this is sort of a man-made crisis. Um, I don't think that we have this crushing budget issue that has to be dealt with at this precise moment or the, the world will end. Uh, I think that we're still in a very anemic recovery and there's a lot of people really struggling out there across the country and that our priority should be strengthening our safety net during times of economic duress. Uh, now is not the time, you know, in my opinion, uh, to be contemplating significant cuts in things that a lot of struggling working class people who've, who've sort of lost grip of the middle class, you know, a lot of the potential spending cuts that are talked about could really have a negative impact on people at a time when they need it the most. So I'm much more concerned about increasing poverty rates, uh, about protecting the, you know, the long-term unemployed uh, than I'm necessarily worried about whether it's another three or six to nine months before we you know, deal with, with the overall issues. But ultimately, what do I think will happen? I think they'll do what they always do. They'll kick the can down the road. They'll extend it out for three, six, nine months, and then we'll have another fiscal cliff once again. Did economic policies in your view, lead to 2008? Did federal economic policies lead to that? Well, I think broad deregulation. So, you know, we had a banking system that was boring. We had boring banking in this country uh, that existed from, out of the, you know, the ashes of the Great Depression uh, and, and the gr wonderful regulatory reforms that we had uh, instituted under, under FDR, and they protected our financial system 
for decades upon decades upon decades. And then you saw, uh, you know, through the end of the Clinton administration, uh, this sort of dismantling of a lot of those protections. And you saw, as, as a result, you saw an increase of concentrated risk in the financial sector and this explosion of these monstrous, these Frankenstein monster banks um, that have that are so big that the failure of any one of which has been deemed to, be, to bring down the entire financial system. And we saw this enormous crisis. So I, I do think that Washington has played a role uh, through deregulation and then also just bad regulation uh, by being too overly deferential to the interests of the big banks and the financial institutions, looking the other way at some really egregious misconduct.